Yeah, I can't answer that. Right. I remember being, I was in Argentina when that happened. It's like, you know, the tears that kind of, that were involved in giving up Gaza. But it's also, it was their, op this is the proof that this, that the experiment didn't work. Right. They had the opportunity to be at peace. And all they had to do was prove that they weren't trying to kill us and they wouldn't have their blockade, as they call it, the open air prison. Right. Really, the open air prison is a protective thing for us that they don't kill us because that's all they do. Rockets, rockets, rockets coming through tunnels. Yeah, that's very tough to kind of. Anti-Israel, because they did not let the Palestinian people out during the war. They would not let them go into Egypt to escape. So Egypt, who has a deal, has a, a treaty with Israel, and all the Arab world that has treaties with Israel don't want Palestinian Palestinian people to leave Palestine. They won't let them, let them out of Palestine during the war, which is why they're all being killed. So, right. And that's not Israel. That's not that's, Israel. Right. I mean, that's the proof that no one likes them, meaning yeah. the people who should be supporting them are their own, I'm going to say brothers, sisters, cousins. Yeah, Egypt's the one. Egypt is... Egypt, Egypt. Syria, Lebanon. I mean, on the other hand, does Israel really want to open that border back and forth? Probably not. That's what the all the tunnels from the Philadelphia quarter are bringing. Say, a one-way ticket out. Yeah, Make yeah. a refugee camp on the other side of the border. So, right. Hundred percent. Right. But you know, and yeah, some Hamas people will help her out, but for the most part. Well, they say, I mean, this is just one of these articles that you know, the real reason why they want the Philadelphia quarter controlled, not by Israel, is because this way they can get out, go to Turkey. If you, for us, there was a telling thing in the news, maybe some of you caught this, and this is going back a couple months ago, when Turkey said that they have over a thousand Hamas fighters in their hospitals being yeah. treated. It's like, wait, yeah. how do they get there? It's like, how do they get there? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, t it's definitely... To go back to your question, the Jewish take is very clear that you shouldn't negotiate and you should fight. When someone wants to kill you, I mean, it was last week's Torah portion, by the way, for an enemy. If it's a, an enemy that attacks the Jewish people, uses the word enemy, and the commentaries highlight that. It's like, don't forget that they're an enemy, that they want you dead. Um, don't be kind, because the minute you turn your back, they're going to kill you. Uh, it's very interesting to read like the, con you know, a, a biblical mandate from a, a text of 3,300 years ago that's still active and present today. Right, that's all of them, but I'm saying when you talk about in war. Um, correct. What's like scary is come up October 7th. Right. Is World War III going? Right. There's actually a very telling line from, I'm going to try to find this quickly. This is a B.B. Netanyahu speech like after... The, the shooting at the Allenby Bridge or crossing, which was the Jordan, um, they murdered three people over there. Yeah, oh yeah. This was his, the end of his text. Hold on, I wanna find this. It was just an interesting, it was about living by the sword. I wanna find the text. Get it. A lot to read through when you talk about Israel news. Here we go. This is his line. And one more word. Some will some ask, will you forever hold a sword? Which is like a good question, right? Like, do we always have to be at war? And he wrote, In the Middle East, without a sword, there is no eternity. Meaning, I take that obviously as a very strongly worded. Unfortunate, that's what it is, that they want us dead to kind of use Sherry's additional uh, insight on that. And if you don't hold that sword, you're dead. Not that we want it. It's the facts on the ground. Um, yeah, it's really sad. Do you think General Jack he was the youngest 
the number two man in the army for many years in Fort Sergeant, retired Fort Sergeant General, who was just part of a bipartisan congressional uh, and an investigation, but an evaluation of our military and the world situation. And I heard him uh, on TV last week where he said that. We are in a position now to closer to getting closer to World War III on a daily basis. Right. And the Middle East is the ginger box or something. Yeah. And Ukraine. Mm -hmm. the well, they were in the news today. Because if if what if if Putin wins. China will then take over Taiwan, and then this will just be a disaster. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's not you and me that are going to suffer, it's our kids and our grandkids who are going to suffer. You're saying we're handing off a bad. Uh... <laughs> Well, that that button changed. Yeah, Albert Einstein once said, "I can't tell you what weapons will be used in the Third World War, but the Fourth World War will be fought with sticks and stones." It's got a lot of implications. All right, you had a question. Company. Yeah, yeah. I remember I remember in the psychology class this though we talked about something like this. Man from life, man has a pugnacious disposition. And it's been proven right. Because no matter what, we're always gonna have another war, another battle. It, I don't know, is it in our DNA? But so you don't think the world's getting any better? Well, I'm a very positive person, so I like to say yes. Right. I no, I, I asked that question on purpose because obviously the Jewish teachings are that the world is headed in a direction to a messianic era. When just to remove the messianic word for a moment and think of it as a good time. Right when everything is going well, and so is this a speed bump or is this a, a bad direction? Is kind of how I look at these things, and there is so much good that is happening in this world as well. So the question is, do we define it by these wars, and 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 or are these wars part of a process though as we head in a better direction? And I I I'm Sam leaving it open. I'm not giving yeah. an answer, but I don't. I don't think we have to define the world by the conflicts. I think we can, def there's a lot of good, right? If you lived in a world 50 years ago, people were not living as long. We had so much more to be content about today. However, we also have news that travels so fast that if you only focus on that, you're going to know all the terrible things that are happening in the world as well. But it's still, it's just something to think about. I, I think uh, Maimonides writes, and guide to the perplexed. So we're talking about also like 13th century, 12th century text. I think that there is more good in this world. We just we focus on the on the negative. That's what that's what sensationalizes the news. I mean, if we're being honest, let's move to U.S. politics for just a second without using people's names. Is you is the U.S. really that bad? Right? People can nitpick things, whatever side of the aisle you're on. But as a big picture, I'd rather be in this country than any other country. Right? We could not like the we could not like the social health care the way it is right now. We could want less or more. Don't get me wrong. We could not like the problems at the border, um, and that's fixable. We could not like the policies with um, I'm going to use just a sensational one, transgender policies. Is that how we define America, though? That's one item. Right. And and if that didn't change or changes, you're still 
living a very good life here or contrary to other or in relation to other countries. But that's just how our world of politics works, how we sensationalize a specific item or cause. But we'll take hours over anything, I think. So that's why for me, like I read, and this is coming up in the news so often these days, like if this happens, I'm leaving this country. Or or de death to America over some is like, dude, you don't like it here. No one's asking you to stay, but trust me, that country's not any better. And you don't want to move there. And over there, if you said death to whatever their country is, you'd be dead. Right? So it's like all these kids in college campuses are fighting for the lives. You know, right. Saying, Go live there under Vermont school yeah, like, and see what that's like if you're a yeah. female. Yeah. Uh, living, living in that. Even if you're a male and you don't like what they say. But yes, if you're a female or if you're going to be against the societal norms of gender identity, 100%. So yeah, that that's the that's the set, all the protests. I think if most of us have seen a video clip or two, not from the news, but maybe on the internet, where they literally go over to these protesters to ask them questions and they don't know what they're talking about. And that's sad. Well, that's different. Right. It's different from how we grew up in the 60s because we did know what we were protesting against. Well, the, right. I was going to say that was an anti war or pro war. It wasn't like. Look, look at tonight. By the way, I, I today I got enlightened. I'm listening to the radio on the way to I go to services in the morning. And I'm like, I know everyone's watching the, tonight's debate, or most people are. But the question was, like on the news, like, does anyone change their mind after a debate? That was what they, the question was. And I've seen that in the news, too. And it's a great yeah. question. And the answer is no. So they described the debate differently. They said, tonight's a pep talk. If you do well, whichever side or both sides, it's a rallying cry to your voters to, to actually go and vote. Because some people just don't vote. But if they feel like they have the momentum, they get up and vote. So he called it, the, the guy on the radio saying, it's a pep talk. It's actually yeah. a pep talk to your base. It does gain votes. You think so? Yeah. There's the 40, undecided, you mean? There's 40% on one side, 40% on the other, and the election is determined by the 20% in the middle, okay? They, when they had the first debate of Kennedy and Nixon, Nixon was very nervous, he was sweating, and, and it was a, a shift after that. When Reagan, uh, had that debate. Right. It was a big well, so I'll, I should yeah. clarify. In today's, uh, I should say this specific election, I think most people have made up their mind. This one. I think this one. But you're saying they're still undecided? The debate between uh, Trump and Biden. And Biden. Yeah, so that's why, my, that's why I'm saying this one is different. This one, that made him jump out of a race. Right or pushed out of a race. So yeah, this one's not happening like that. So this one, like, which mm -hmm. to actually, you make a good point, right? By that debate, he had to get people to show up because he already had a bad vibe to him. Old, however you want to look at the news, right? Old, forgetful. I'm using all the terms that people had in their mind. So his own base wasn't excited, and then the debate proved it. Right, it made them even more nervous. But this one, that's not what people are, are thinking is going to happen. So this one's more like she gave a new boost. OK, we have something to go for. And now the question is, will the people who don't always vote show up because they think she lost or they think she's going to win? Right. You have to kind of the mindset and same thing or the other way. The news was your only. Yeah, there was no internet. There was no. Yeah, there's no. But I, I, I think you're right though. On a traditional election, this is not a traditional election. On a traditional election, yes, there are real, there are true undecideds. But here you have even. I mean, I mean, you might be right. There probably still are. It might not be twenty percent, but there's always going to be somebody who changes their minds. You got but two it, members of the last election huh? was decided by about 
40,000 votes. Right. No, for, you're the right. The whole country. You're right. So it doesn't take many changing, you know, if a few thousand people in key states yeah. change their vote, Changes the I do election. find that fascinating. Nothing to do with this yeah. specific election. The way the U.S. is is like we really are almost like a 50 50 ish split, and it's like where this where's the wind blowing on this election? You're gonna have this way, which is pretty fascinating, right? That we could be so down the middle. You look at other countries; it doesn't work like that, right? In Israel, for example, since that's on everyone's kind of radar, mm -hmm. the way Parliament works there is you need to make a coalition because it's never 50%. If it was 50%, you'd never worry about coalitions. But right. you create the coalition because 30% went with Likud, 10% went with whatever, and then it's like, okay, let's build it. You have small percentage of people can change. And it has happened. When the older Bush was running for re-election, the fact that Ross Perot came in as a third party I remember that. Right, and that's the same thing that they were worried about Kennedy, and they're still right. Why? Who was the Ralph Nader? Okay, didn't come in as a third party candidate. He would have. Right, right. Florida, uh, Bush won by under two hundred votes, and there were tens. The hanging chat. What was it called? No, it was over. Right. Yeah, there's even there's a major flub up tonight. Then it can't. Well, I'll tell you what, because the mics are muted, because the mics are muted, meaning let's say I'm going to use Trump being badgered, he can't be badgered tonight because the mics are muted. So you can't like go at him when he's saying something. And the same thing is in the reverse, I assume. I don't know. I'm saying that's what they're saying. But yeah, no, I mean, just. I just, going back to kind of this, it's it's a very interesting thing in the sense of like the politics of it. Any questions though? You had a question that you don't want to ask today here. Any, uh, so this is always, Sherry, it's always open questions. I do bring a text, but yeah. we're already at 11.45. I won't start this one. I have other stuff I can share. Um, but I like, for me, one thing that a story that made a very Im meaningful impact in how I kind of do discussions was a question that was asked to me in a retirement community many years ago. A lady came over to me and asked, Esther was Jewish, right? I said, yeah. So how was she allowed to marry Ahasuerus, who wasn't Jewish? That was the question that she asked me. And I gave her an answer. It was a Purim question. And she said, thank you. She left Jewish teachings and everything Jewish because she asked that question in Hebrew school. And the rabbi slapped her across the face for even asking the question. And so I realized then that a lot of people grew up that you, first of all, you didn't ask the question just in case you were judged or you didn't have who to ask. And so I like to make sure that this is always, there's, sometimes I don't know the answer um, and that's, that's fine. Never. <laughs> um, listen, I sit in front of the internet. I can quickly. <laughs> I can't figure out still how your big brain is talking to your head. Um, yeah, it's a lot of reading. Yeah. Well, you know what, my rabbi, I'll tell you something. I don't remember everything. I wish I did. But I remember when I took my last test for to become a rabbi, it's four tests that, the way we were tested. And the rabbi said, I don't expect you to know the answers, but I expect you to know where to look. And that was his advice for us. Um, and I think it's a very important thing. It's like, because if not, there's a tendency by people to answer even when they don't know the answer, because how could they not know the answer? It's like, that's a very bad tendency. So it's better to say, I don't know, let me research it. So I, I don't I don't think I know all the answers. I wish I remembered all the details, stories, anecdotes. I mean, that's an amazing- uh... We use factor and encyclopedias. Yeah, but now it's literally, I mean, even the Torah is at your fingertips. It's like, I can Google a question. I can Google a verse. Yeah. She doesn't understand Hebrew, though. <laughs> I'm sure there's one that does. Probably. Uh, you probably have to change the language. I don't know. Say CEO, where they ask CEOs how, you know, he said he keeps everything he needs to know on a three by five card. 
everything else he can look up because he knows where to find the answer. I'm curious what he keeps on the cart. <laughs> That's the question. I was familiar with the catalog comic or schlummer. Of course. I was a CFO of comic or schlummer. And I kept a little spiral notebook about that big in my desk. And every day I would make certain notes in there based on what was going on. And about four or five days before the end of the month, I would tell the president of the company how much we were going to make or lose. He says, I didn't know that. I had my own way. <laughs> the little black book. <laughs> and he said to me, what's that? I said, that's my job security. <laughs> The three, which was more important than that, was if a cow or animal that was being slaughtered did not look healthy. It looked like it would die within the year. It was not kosher. And so a lot of people look at kosher and say, oh, it's healthier. I want to do kosher too. That's that's just bad uh, cooking. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's just bad cooking because you could still have a rare piece of meat. But yes, I actually, well, I I know what you mean. I was actually asking my brother about like a meat that he made for Shabbos, and I had bought the same cut. I'm like, how do you do it? He's like, how, I'm like, how do you know? He's like, oh, my kids like it fully cooked. I'm like, oh no, I don't want that. I want to make sure it's got a little bit of you know color. So I understand what you're saying, but the laws of kosher for milk and meat specifically now are. Three times in the Torah, it says, do not kick a, do not cook a kid. And we don't mean a baby. We mean a kid goat mm -hmm. in its mother's milk. Because it says it three times, we learned, the rabbis taught, that there are three prohibitions involved in that same verse or in, this, in, in those three. Number one is you cannot cook them together. Number two, so cook it. We're not even talking about eating it. Number two is you can't eat it. Really, I should say you can't eat it, you can't cook it. And you couldn't have any benefit from it. So I'm going to give you an example of benefit. If I own Dairy Queen as a franchise, and then I become religious and I'm like learning, wait a second, the laws of milk and meat, technically I shouldn't make any profits. I shouldn't make any benefit off the milk and meat products. And so if you have a partner, you'd want to split where these profits go. And that's what people do if they're in that situation. There was a family in Pittsburgh that owned over 50 or something restaurants. They became more religious. Originally, they kept their restaurants and just split their profits with their other partners. And then eventually, it's the best thing is to not have anything to do with it. So they sold their franchises. Now, there are ways to work with this, but like that was where they kind of um, moved and how they wanted to be comfortable with that. So the, the short gist, though, is if we're being very honest, do not cook a kid in its mother's milk is very specific. It is the child in its mother's milk. But the prohibition goes to all uh, milk and meat. So it's not just a goat in its mother's. It could be another, it could be milk from another animal. We've attached this law to not just beef, but even chicken, even though chicken in the Torah is not considered meat. And so really, if you had a chicken burger with cheese on the biblical side of the law, that would not be a biblical trend, uh, issue. But the rabbis understood, just like I, I, I know that some people have a hick, uh, have like kind of a hang up with this. I'm going to elaborate for just a, sick, a quick second. The rabbis understood that if if someone is less knowledgeable and see somebody eating a hamburger that's made of chicken or turkey with cheese, and somebody who doesn't know better just sees the hamburger and they don't know that it's chicken, they'll do that with an actual meat burger. And so, just like any other legislative body like even in the United States and other countries, they create laws to protect you from something worse off. And so that was a legislated law that they attached the idea a little bit further. Now, because of that, we don't do any milk and meat together. And really cooking does not mean putting a slice of cheese on top of it. If you think about it, cooking means you're cooking it in the same pots or the same pan but we've attached all these extra additional precautionary laws to protect us from doing a truly biblical issue. What if you don't cook it together? What if you're having a hamburger and a glass of milk? So now you're going into 
because of that, there because you might eat it together, we have a couple of other laws that come from that. So I'm going to share that. So this is where you find where people wait between eating milk and meat, right? So from milk to meat, you wait an hour. I'm giving you the standards. And from meat to milk, you wait six hours. There are two reasons for that. One is digestion and one is things that are left in your mouth. But I will share something. So in, in Jewish texts, they go very far with this, like theorizing and questioning. So what happens if I just swallowed the meat? It's not in my teeth. It's not stuck in between my teeth. Then you have to worry about digestion, right? That you're digesting it together. So to go back to this for just a moment, um, there are different traditions. The standard that most people do is the six hours from meat to milk and one hour from milk to meat. But there are some communities that over our history that don't wait anything from milk to meat. They just rinse their mouth, meaning have it as a separate meal. And then from meat to milk, you might find a community that does three hours. There are some other traditions. The only time from milk to meat that you would wait the same like six hour period are hard cheeses because they take longer to digest and they also sometimes get stuck within your teeth. Yeah. The bakery is kosher there. But not the actual. And there's a sign out in front for the lunch special, a ham sandwich. <laughs> it's in the same store. All right. The bread is, and there's the a same significant place. number of boys, perhaps, people who mm. shop there when they at the bakery. I know. So the, there are people who are very uncomfortable with that setup because I'll explain. Let's say the setup is a normal thing. I mean, Chompies, you can also, their bakery is kosher and their food in their restaurant is not, but you're not buying kosher. They don't say come to the store, to the restaurant to buy the food. Their bakery items are sold somewhere else. It's a totally separate part of their building. This is very different. To buy from Bagels and Bialis, for example, you can buy bread or bagels at the counter. It had to walk through the restaurant area. Right? That's just how it works. Yeah. And they're constantly for their bakery going in for their deli counter going into the bakery side to bring more. So there is more possibility. I don't want to say likelihood, possibility of making a mistake. So there are people who are very uncomfortable with the setup. I'm not mixing in over here. Um, I'm just sharing that you have to. This is what I've learned in all kosher, in general in kosher, you have to trust the certifying agency. And if you don't trust the certifying agency, then you obviously wouldn't eat there. So if you go to a town and you don't know who certifies the restaurant and says certified, you got it, you got, and you don't want to just trust it on blind faith, you'd learn a little bit more about who's the rabbi, is he actually checking? That's where you have the issues. Now, so glot kosher, very good little detail. Glot means smooth. So glot kosher is an additional step in, in slaughter where they check the lungs to make sure it's smooth. Now I'll, I'll elaborate, but just on a brief point of that, that's going to tell you if the animal's healthy. So if the animal has any lesions inside of its lungs, which is very common by the way, the question is, was that a more recent scar tissue that kind of adhered to block a hole in the lung? And to get a real glot animal, is less and less, I think they say less than 30% of every slaughtered animal is glots. So in America, and in, when you go to like Argentina and South America, which a lot of kosher meat comes from, they have better standards or better rates because it is more grass fed. And so grass is healthier. They have less, I don't know if the number was 30%. It's, it's very low. Apropos of nothing, I was going to make some more matzo balls for a Passover. And my matzo meal didn't say kosher for Passover. So I ran out to the store and like three stores later, I was finally in Safeway and they had matzo meal that was kosher for Passover. And they had this big kosher display, lovely, everything was perfect. Except for the fact, mm -hmm. sticking on the side of the display said, ham sale. 
one ninety nine a pound. Passover <laughs> sale. <laughs> yeah, so I, I was hysterical. I took the sign off and I went and found the manager and I said, could we talk about this, please? And of course, they took the sign away, but it was just everything was so perfect. And then there was the hand sign. <laughs> right. I just want to go back to the glot thing. Mm -hmm. If it's not glot, it can still be kosher. But it is a higher standard. Um, and most times when you buy in the supermarket today, I don't think I ever see non-glot other than Hebrew National. Hebrew National, let's say when it has the kosher on it, it's actually non-glot. So, yeah, but it's still kosher. Meaning if somebody, I won't eat it, let's say, right? But if that was in my oven, I don't kosher my oven. That's a kosher meat. So Hebrew National is really the only um, product line that I see locally that is a non-glot meat. I'm sure there are more. It's just what catches my eye. So what made, what made you want to be a lot rather than just culture? Mm -hmm. um, me or in general? Either way. So there, uh, I'm going to share two answers to this. Mm -hmm. One is I grew up that way, right? The question is, would, would I peel off a layer? Um, but number two is it is the better standard, right? It is questionable if an animal that is non-glot would have been surviving a year. And so if it's glot, we say, okay, that's that's a healthy animal. If it's non-glot, it means that there's, if there would be a hole, it's it's not kosher at all. We're talking about where lesions or, or scar tissue cover over certain holes of the lungs. And so now you're talking about an animal that's possibly not as healthy. Like that's kind of how the, it's part of the Jewish laws of kosher. So standards are important. Like, you know, I tell people all the time, you're putting up a mezuzah at your house and you ask the rabbi, how much is a mezuzah? And he says, well, I can get you from $40 to 130. And I'm like, okay, which one should I get? And the rabbi says, they're all kosher, right? They are. So why would someone pay $130? We can get it for 40. I mean, we're Jewish, right? Why are we going for the most expensive? So there's a couple answers to this. Number one is what's your standard? Are you driving a Toyota or are you driving a Lexus, right? What can you afford? What's your lifestyle? So there's a part of this that's a financial question. Like, what can you afford? And then there's a part of it that says, wait a second, why is that $130 and this one $40? And the answer is it's nicer. The calligraphy, the penmanship, um, and just because they're both kosher, just because both cars drive doesn't mean that I'm going to go with the cheaper car. So it's it's really a question that each of us would have to ask in those situations. But with kosher, it's a little different, right? Because if they're both kosher, they're both kosher. But with here, we're saying, no, there's a question on this one that some rabbis will say it's not. So why would I go for the, the item that isn't as good? Just to use Amazon reviews, you can get two different, um, for me, this is a great example. I'm buying a new mouse for my laptop. I have a wireless mouse, the other one died. I'm going to read a review. Which one's going to have less issues when you read the performance reviews? That is that is kind of the same thing with when you talk about glot kosher meat or non-glot. It's like, what is the, let me talk about the performance review of this cow. That's kind of how I look at that. But based on the verses, we want that meat to be from a cow that was healthy. That doesn't have potential. I'm going to use that word on purpose, potential health issues. To check that. Um, I'll tell you what. No, you have a very good question. You have a very good question. In the kosher um, slaughtering processes, there are a number of layers to it. There's the slaughterer, but the slaughterer himself has to ha has to know the laws about his knife. Right, the knife can't have nicks. Has to be checked. He also has to know where to cut. He has to know how to cut. So there's somebody who, who will oversee that as well, just to make sure they're checking and doing their thing. Then that same shokat might also check the lungs, might not, but somebody else will also. And then there's another part to kosher. The hind part of an animal is not eaten by Jewish people. Why not? Because of the story with Jacob. So Jacob is attacked by an angel, he is injured. He loses, like the, the angel maims him. He, he actually um, knocks him on his side and from his hip and he can't walk. And so because of that, it says, we don't eat the hind side of the animal till this very day. It's in that verse. 
Um, so there are two ways to go about this. Some people, most actually in the slaughtering business, will just take off the back hind leg and sell it to a non-kosher um, production plant for, for meat. So that's easier because you just cut it off and gave it. But let's say you wanted to keep that side. You might have another person who will kind of dissect what areas are really problematic and what are not. But again, the minute you do that, your meat goes up, right? Because now you're talking about another person who you're paying for their um, services. Well, that's what I was going to follow up with. I want to be blood kosher. I'm religious, but I truly cannot afford the extra cost of the blood kosher meat. meat. So there's two answers to this question. Mm -hmm. One is don't eat meat. Right, that's going to be some of some people's answers. They're going to eat meat once a week, or or I'll, I'll be honest. Actually, here's a good example: gefilte fish that many of us know about. Right, you get a gefilte fish roll. One of the origins, or we don't know where it started, but one of the theories was that Jewish people are meant to have fish on Friday night. It's just part of the tradition that how to celebrate Shabbat is through food and wine. What food? And so there's in the Talmud, they discuss this. And one opinion is fish. One opinion is meat. So a lot of families will do both. You'll have a chicken course and a fish course. The problem was if they couldn't afford fish, what did they do? Fish is expensive, right? It's a, it, before you even touch the meat prices, fish is also expensive. And so they couldn't afford it for their large family or whatever it is. They bought a small fish and made it into fish loaf, right? You take a little that goes a long way. And so that was... For the times, people made those types of decisions. So that's why I say one answer is you buy within your means. The other answer is you might find in communities that they do co-ops to, to bring prices a little bit lower. And then you will also find in communities that closer to the holidays, um, there might be funds that actually either give meat or give money towards purchasing products for families that can't afford so they can have an enjoyable holiday. Um, but yeah, it's a very good question. So glot kosher is not kosher. I don't even want to say glot kosher. Kosher is not cheap. Yeah, but glot kosher has got to be a lot. But I, yes, but I don't even, I, I don't have what to compare it to because I haven't seen this. I do know it's cheaper. In fact, my my dad has tried over the, over the years. Chompy sells a lot of kosher, not kosher, a lot of, holiday dinners, Passover, Rosh Hashanah, but it's not kosher meat. And so he has tried that they should buy the non-glot briskets. They're way cheaper per pound than the glot briskets, but they're still not even close to the non-kosher. And so it's like, a, you know, can you kind of eat your profits a little bit so you're actually giving a kosher meat? And it's not easy. Um, but it's, it's an idea. So yes, if, if you're hosting a dinner and you're on the fence about it and you're like, listen, I'm not ready to pay $9 or $10 a pound for brisket, but I'm ready to pay $6 a pound for brisket, right? The non-kosher you're going to find for $3, but you're ready to go a little bit half halfway. Where do you buy that? I haven't seen, I haven't seen non glot but it's worth asking. I, they're not going to be necessarily the cheapest. Probably cost so I haven't seen that in Costco. I could probably get it through a distributor, but I've never asked. I, I'm actually going to, I'm curious, and I'm going to text them later just to ask what the price difference is. It's yeah. That meat is glot, and it's not cheap. It's a I good meat. It. So it's it's like eighteen ninety nine a pound. Way more than Imperials. You're paying some really high-end prices. Yeah. Okay, so I heard you asking that before. How can what? Chicken thigh. If the thigh is the problem, it wasn't on the chicken. It was on meat. So meat was the issue, not chicken. Oh, so then why is an egg part? Mm -hmm. Great question. No, it's a, it's a good question. The egg should be technically chicken, right? Comes from a chicken. And therefore, if chicken is considered meat now, why isn't the egg also considered meat now? And this is one of the beautiful things of uh, Torah law that says, when the rabbis add on a law to protect us, we don't go past that. So they added a layer to it. We don't go two layers. 
So the chicken we went to, but we didn't do it to the egg. And part of that is people don't necessarily associate an egg when they see it as a piece of meat. But yes, someone could question that, which is why the question is a very good question. But we don't go beyond, like we don't add to theirs. They already added, that's enough for us. So we, we don't have to add another layer to it. But yes, the egg is part of technically just like the chicken was. Yes, my question, the fears that our first person will answer. Those. What answers have you given, have you received? Let's hear. Because, it's usually because. Yeah, no. All right. No, the, the short answer is, is we don't extend these rabbinic decrees further, which is to our benefit. Because if you if you think about it, these decrees would never end. I, I'm calling them decrees, but these extra you know layers of rules. So did you just say that the chicken breast can be kosher, but the no, I was saying on the chicken we don't apply that. Oh. thigh issue so um karen asked about salting meat there is a prohibition of eating blood so any blood that comes from an animal you can't eat in i want to just share something let's say you get cut in your mouth not a problem but if you're cut on your lip you shouldn't be eating that blood it's exterior i'm giving that example all right it's out of your mouth so my the question that my kids always ask is, wait, you, you open up the meat package and red juice comes out. It's like, how is that not blood, right? And I tell them, oh, that's protein juice. Yes. <laughs> it, and that's really what is, it's the, it's the liquid of the, of the muscles that like, that it's not blood because we've already salted it enough. It's not blood. Um, I think your nose is good for blood. Maybe. No, you, you should, you, you could Google that one. That's, you don't need a Jewish answer for that. So your friend gets stolen. Hold on, hold on. One second. You're asking a very good question, but I don't even know if you realize. Okay, salting is the way to remove blood. However, you can also roast to get the blood out. So when your, your question is, if I've salted it, you can have, of course, medium rare because there's no blood in there. You can have rare, but if you roast it, if you roast it, there might be a slightly different. How do you know that you've gotten enough heat in there to remove all the blood? That might have a slightly different answer. And I would have to research that quickly. Yeah, yeah, because it was salted before it came to your home. The only time you'll find in kosher that I've seen today, if you went into a store that you'd still need to salt something is liver liver is made of blood and so the salting is not enough and so sometimes you find that supermarkets when they sell it they have a little paper that says there is another part to this kosher that you got to do which is salting and they give you a uh, roasting and they give you the instructions i haven't seen that in a long time but i used to we buy cases of chicken all the time when we do our shabbat dinners and they used to come with an, another like small little bag in the box and it was the liver and it was not salted. Now we weren't using it for our um, dinners, so I would give that away. But whoever was getting that had to learn how to salt it and roast it. It's part of the process, yeah. Today, I think you can buy liver already fully processed, you know, like the salting and the roasting. But yeah, if you didn't, you'd go learn how to use it. I will tell you something very fascinating. Can you make your barbecue not kosher because of this blood? Who's barbecuing liver? Well, if you're roasting it, you got to roast it to make it kosher. It's an interesting question. I'm sharing just the question. The answer is it's not so simple. No, some things are. Go eat an egg. Right. Although I learned, I learned quail eggs, just to give you an example of not so simple. So is quail a kosher bird or not? Some are. <laughs> That's the answer. <laughs> so like people who sell quail eggs, like on the side of the street, for example, which there are people every now and then, like I need to know what quail that was. And me, I have no clue what a quail looks like this way or that way. So like you can buy, I think, in Costco quail eggs that are kosher. I think I saw they have an OU certification. Apparently, it's a delicacy. One for kosher and one for not kosher? Yeah, yes, because my dad eats non kosher. Got you. 
No, because I actually have two barbecues, one for pizza and one for meat. Like we we do pizza on the grill, so which is very good. So that's why I had a different I had a different grill. Yeah. Yeah, so that's much easier to come by. Kosh so I'll and the reason is because like you're milking a cow. Most cheeses that you find are from kosher animals. There could be standards with that too, don't get me wrong, but it's so much easier to get a kosher cheese. Fries, Imperial, Trader Joe's. Trader Joe's. Trader Joe's has kosher. And then I buy from a distributor. So depending on what I'm buying. But with the kosher food can be accepted to have in Glendale. I'm sorry, be familiar with the kosher food pantry at Seventh Avenue in Glendale. No. Isn't there a food okay. people in need? But they sell on the side, is what she's getting at. Anyone can go and get a bag of food every day, one time a day. They sell the meat, the other is free. And I don't remember the name. Yeah. I call it the kosher food. Yeah, no, I think that's what it's called. There's a Hebrew word. There's a Hebrew word. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, not too far. Uh, yeah, we are in Korea. It's on 7th. Um, yeah, it's on 7th. Yeah. 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 I had been in it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know anything about the meat. I just know, and I don't know anything about the prices, of course. Uh, but I just know that you can get everything. Listen, it's Rosh Hashanah time. We got to know this stuff, you know? Okay. Now is when everyone starts complaining about brisket prices. Yeah. That and Pesach. So. Yeah, so, so I went to, wasn't too kosher. I went to Costco, and I bought the brisket, and they didn't have enough. Big fan of it. So Jamie said to me, Why don't you go to the Safeway track? I went to Safeway, they had bridge, it was half the price of cost. Really? But it was a different grade. That's usually what I find. Like I look at the newspaper, you know, every now and then you see, oh wow, look how cheap brisk is. And then you look at the Costco, um, whatever there is is oh, I'll give you a different one. I don't really look at the brisket, I look at the wagyu. I'm always curious how much that costs. And I see that for $100 or for $200. I'm like, wait a second. I went to a kosher restaurant and bought a Wagyu steak, not in Arizona. And I paid $140 for like a pound. So how are they selling, you know, for a hundred? There's no way that mine was the same quality. That's what I'm getting at. Because they're selling it for more. Probably. No, they're, even on the at the restaurant I was at, there were different levels of Wagyu. But anyways, I'm going to blow the show far. Today is the... Seventh day of the month of Elul, which is leading up to Rosh Hashanah. And there is a tradition that leading up to the to the high holidays, you blow the shofar each day to kind of get you in the spirit. It's a month that we kind of do an introspection or to use an example that I've always been taught is an inventory, right? An inventory means you look at what went right in your business. You'll buy more of that. You look at what's not selling, you'll put it on sale to get rid of it and then you'll stop carrying that product. And that's the same thing in our own lives that we look at our year, like what went well, what did I do good Jewishly that I want to celebrate and do more of? And what maybe wasn't so good, maybe it even directed me in the wrong direction. I got to get rid of that. And so that's the inventory of the year. It's a very appropriate time in the month. And one last little detail, there is a parable that was taught that said in this month, the king is in the field, meaning... This is a very appropriate time to connect with God. He's even closer in the sense of listening and accessible than throughout the year. Not that throughout the year it's not accessible, but God's always accessible. But in this month, it's even more. So if there's something that you need to pray for or connect with, it's an appropriate time. So I will blow the shofar, but I am going to stop the recording on the Zoom, Karen. I'll leave it on so you can hear it. <laughs>